My name is Joshua, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'd like to welcome you here this morning, whether you're a weekly attender or a first-time visitor. We are glad that you're here, and we welcome you with the welcome of Christ. Now, today's service is a little bit different. Uh, Just in full disclosure, we have a deacon's ordination today, which means this sermon is going to be shorter. So some of you may think that that's a really good thing. It's, it's, a, it's a hard thing for pastors. It's the thing we hate to hear. Um, so yeah, this is a little bit shorter sermon uh, because we have the ordination coming up later on in the service. Um, today I'm going to be preaching from the passages that we just heard read to us. Um, and so if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark 10. If you don't, I invite you to go to the back. There's some round tables back there with Bibles that are available for you. Um, if you don't have a Bible, you can take that home. Um, and that'll be our gift to you. And, um, and go ahead and turn there. And then this, is a, this is a timely passage uh, to use for deacons' ordination service because deacons are called to serve the church. And in this passage, it's one of the most famous passages in the Gospels, Jesus calls us to serve. And he says to follow Christ means that you are called to this radical life of self-sacrifice and service to others. And he actually says the way to love our neighbor, as he's been teaching us to, to love our neighbor, the way to love our neighbor is not just in an abstract, sentimental way, but it's a concrete way. The way to love our neighbor is to serve our neighbor. So to follow Christ is to serve others. So today we're going to look at two points. We're going to look at the problem of serving and the price of serving. So Jesus tells us to serve others, but there's a problem, and here's the problem. We are self-centered people. We um, are not naturally others-centered. We come out of the box looking for our own needs to be met. Now, some people may have the gift of serving, but I don't. Um, I used to actually be one of those people who said, Hey, does anybody here need like seconds or a refill or anything? Oh, you do? Well, while you're up, um, get me a refill, please. You know, my needs are internal. My needs are immediate. I don't need to to be reminded of my own needs. I'm already reminded of my needs. Others' needs are external. I have to learn of them. Now, the author David Foster Wallace um, gave a commencement address at Kenyon College in 2005 It's become very popular, and he put it this way. He said, other people's thoughts and feelings have to be communicated to you somehow, but your own are so immediate, urgent, real. Our hard wiring, our default setting is to be self-centered. It's to think of our own needs. We don't have to be taught self-centered, but yet we are taught to be self-centered. See, it, the pressure to have our own needs met is not just internal, it's also external. We live in a world that tells us, seek your own needs, put your own needs above the needs of others. So we have both nature and nurture working against us. Again, Wallace put it this way, he says, and the world will not discourage you from operating on your default settings. Because the world of men and money and power hums along quite nicely on the fuel of fear and contempt and frustration and craving and the worship of self. Our own present culture has harnessed these forces in ways that have yielded extraordinary wealth and comfort and personal freedom. The freedom to be lords of our own tiny skull-sized kingdoms alone at the center of all creation. That's true, right? Our wiring, our nature tells us that we're at the center of the universe, and the world tells us that's the way we should do it. That's the way we should live. Now, Jesus said the first will be last, and the last will be first. But what do you do when you live in a world where the first is first, and the last is last? Where the ambition, the ambitious are promoted, and the servants are forgotten. You know, the Tour of California is going on right now, and so I'm thinking of the world of cycling. Lance Armstrong is here in our city now. And if you remember, um, he's not here, I presume. Um, Lance, nope, okay. However you feel about Lance Armstrong, 
you know that he lost his seven Tour de France championship jerseys because he cheated. Now, he broke the rules, but he actually kept one rule. He kept the rule to win. The rule that our culture has taught us from the beginning, to win. And that's what he said when he confessed on Oprah. He said, it was win at all costs, survive. That was the rule that I followed. So he kept the rule that our culture has taught us from the beginning. Now, this, this doesn't just, you know, is not contained to cycling. You know, there, there are folks in law school who are taking Adderall to, to stay up and to focus and to study, to rise above their classmates. There's a pressure to plagiarize if you're in the publishing world or the academic world to make a name for yourself. Whatever world we live in, we actually have this pressure to cheat, to win at all cost, to overwork, to be ambitious, to, to become higher up in our status. And what are we trying to get at with all of this ambition and all of this striving? What is it about winning that we like? It's that winning brings us honor. It's that rising up in status, becoming a leader in our culture or in our community brings us honor. We want honor. Now, there is a reason why we might serve others. Because sometimes serving others brings us honor. And when it brings us honor, we might serve our neighbor. But when we do, we're actually serving ourselves. You think of like the magnanimous, like, no, I'll pay for lunch, you know, to be seen as the one who pays for lunch. But there are lots of ways that we seek our own honor and we seek to avoid dishonor. In fact, that's actually what's going on in this passage. If you look at verses 35 to 37, um, the apostles are fighting over honor. You remember last week in our passage, if you were here, Peter, one of the apostles, says to Jesus, see, now that, that word is important, we're going to come back to that. He said, see, look, look, we have left everything and followed you. Look, we have nothing. We've left it all for you, Jesus. And in this passage, what, what are James and John fighting over? They're saying, we've left everything to follow you, but we did it not as a divestment, but as an investment. We did it so that we might get honor, so that we might be put in a position of authority and leadership so that our names will be honored. They said, hey, we've left everything to follow you because we believed in you, Jesus. We believed in you. And we know that when you get to Jerusalem, you're going to sit on a throne and you're going to rule the nations. And you're going to rule the nations in your glory. And when you do, don't forget about the little people who got you there, Jesus. We're almost to Jerusalem, so we're going to start putting this bug in your ear. We'd, we're going to make our bids for your cabinet. You know, put me over the treasury. Put me over the Department of Interior. Make me Secretary of State. Let us two brothers sit on the right and left when you sit on your throne in Jerusalem. Actually, a chapter ago, just one chapter back in Mark 9, the apostles were fighting over who would be the greatest. Who's the greatest among us? Who's, who's the greatest apostle? This is not just a competitive keeping of score. They wanted honor. They wanted to be honored. But that's absurd, right? Fighting for honor, jockeying for honor. We don't do that. Uh, we don't live in an honor-shame culture where, where we need to decide who gets to sit at the left and the right of the powerful. Uh, we would never do that, would we? Well, I'll tell you how I do that. I feel that when I see someone else honored, and I want to be honored, and I'm not. After my first week of grad school, seminary, at our orientation, the president of the seminary came out, and he started to tell us, you know, you guys are, you're, you're all here. You've left a lot to be here. And I'm thinking, yeah, I have. I've left a lot to be here. This is really good to hear. And he said, Russ, for example, now, Russ, there's two things you need to know about Russ. One is he was older than most of us, so he stuck out that way because he was in his early 50s. The other way he stuck out is that he drove a brand new Mercedes every day to class. 
And the president of the seminary says, now Russ, for example, he left a lucrative career to come to seminary to follow the calling. And I'm thinking, yeah, but Russ didn't leave his Mercedes. (laughs) He didn't leave his retirement. I never had the chance to pursue the lucrative career to leave. I'm, I'm going to this as a young man. What about me? What about my honor? When is he going to call, call on me and say, what, look at Joshua, look at what he's left. See, we, we may not fancy ourselves an honor or shame culture until the other person is being honored and we're not. How do you feel when you're dishonored? How do you feel when a student in arrogance implies that they could do better than you, the teacher? It's kind of what's going on here, right, with James and John. We can drink the cup that you can drink, Jesus. We can do that. Yeah, we're, we're peers. How do you feel when your roommate gets asked out by the guy that you like? How do you feel when your coworker, who bends the rules to win at all costs, actually does win and get promoted over you? Or how do you feel when it's just the overworked, the overworking coworker who gets the position of honor? What do you do when your husband gets credit for something that you did? See, when someone else is honored, we feel that need. What about me? Will I be honored? And so we trade and we jockey and we compete as well for honor, just like the apostles did. And what we find is that, you know, we think sometimes if I can serve others, if I can give up a career maybe, if I can cut my salary in half to go do something else, but it brings me honor, then maybe I'll count the cost. Because to give up our honor, to serve others is always costly, right? If we live in the rat race, then that means to stop and help someone means that others get ahead of us. If Lance Armstrong would have helped the slower guys, he wouldn't have had the yellow jersey. It's just the way it works. There's a cost to serving others. And that brings me to my second point, the price of service. The very nature of serving itself implies that there's a cost that we have to give up for our neighbor, give up for someone else, give up our needs to meet another's needs. And so Jesus uses this language to show that service is a high cost and that to serve another means that we have to become their slave in some way. Now, that being the case, we might be tempted here to twist Jesus' words. We might be tempted to say, oh, this is just a commencement address. This is Jesus telling us to serve other people. And we might say, okay, well, the, the primary lesson here is to become a servant. The primary lesson is to, to give up more, to become better at serving. And if we did, if we left here and that was it, all we said was that Jesus wants us to serve then we'd leave with some self-loathing because we'd know that it's against our nature and our nurture to serve others. And we'd leave with some self-confidence thinking that we could do it in our own power. But that's not what's going on here. See, in fact, you could even say, well, let's use the words of Jesus to guilt us into being better servants. Look, the Son of Man came not to be served, and who are you to think others should serve you? If even Jesus wasn't served, then you should serve others. But if we did that, we'd miss the point. So I have to confess here, I don't actually think the purpose of this passage is to to primarily call us into a life of radical self-sacrifice and service of others. And I think Jesus gives us the key to this passage. In verse 33, Jesus tells us, see, this is, he says, this is not a commencement address what I'm telling you in this passage, it's not a commencement address, it's not a motivational speech, this is actually an itinerary. In verse 33, he says, see, there's that word again, look. Remember when Peter says, look, we've left all and followed you. Look at what we have done, look at our accomplishments. Jesus says, no, you look, look down the road. Look at what he says, see, we are going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. In other words, Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, you are promoting yourself 
and asking me to look at you. I'm asking you to look at me. I'm walking the road to dishonor. I will be dishonored in the most shocking and startling ways and I'll be killed. This is where I'm going. James and John, I'm not going to Jerusalem for a throne, but a cross. And the ones on my left and right will be criminals crucified with me. This is where I'm going, and I'm doing it for your sin. Even the sin of self-centeredness, even the insidious nature of yourself to be self-centered that creeps into every part of your life, even the good parts. I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'll be dishonored for those sins, for your sins. This is the cost of service. It's that the Son of Man would be dishonored and killed for our sakes. In fact, he said, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, there is a cost to our sin and shame, and he pays the cost. So the main point of this passage, standing here in the road to Jerusalem, with Jerusalem maybe even in the distance, as Jesus stops and calls them to himself to teach them here, the main point of this passage is not to be a servant. The main point of this passage is this. You have a servant. The Son of God. Jesus came to serve you. Peter, James, and John, the apostles, and all who have faith in him. Jesus came to be a servant. The main point of this passage is that you would count yourself among the served, is that you would hear him talking as you were caught in your selfish ambition, and you would hear him saying, I became slave. I became a servant for your sins, for your shame. I serve you. So we can go to other passages to teach us that we should be God's servants, but in this passage, we see that we have God as our servant. Mysteriously, how can that be? How can God be our servant? The question is this, will you count yourself among the many? Will you count yourself among those that he came to ransom? Will you see that your sin is a cost that you can't pay? It's a ransom that you can't earn but that he gave his life as a ransom for your sin. Now, even in his act of teaching the disciples here, you may see that he's serving them in kindness. The apostles, remember, are indignant at James and John, but Jesus isn't angry, or at least we're not told that he is. Instead, he loves and he cares for them right there on the road, and he serves them right where they are on the way to Jerusalem. Fleming Rutledge And her book on the crucifixion put it this way, the simple description of him calling them to himself speaks volumes. She's talking about verse 42. His patient understanding of them and their weaknesses, his loving correction of their foolishness, his patient reorientation of their way to his way, his total commitment to their eternal future, all of these and more manifest in that scene. He's even serving them on his road to the cross. And see, when when you realize that, that God has become your servant, has taken the form of a servant who's obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross for your sake, it turns everything upside down. The cross there in Jerusalem turns everything upside down. And in fact, what it's teaching us is that the kingdom of God is coming, and in the kingdom of God, it's not a place where, where you become a leader in order to gain honor. It's actually where leadership is a path to service. The kingdom of God is, is the opposite of this world, but it's this world that's upside down. This world is upside down, and Jesus says, I will make it right. I will bring my kingdom, and I'll turn this world upside down, and the cross and the resurrection are the proof of that. And so if you see that God serves you, if you count yourself among the many that are ransomed by his blood, then you actually will follow him to the cross and a life of sacrifice for others. 
you will become a servant of others if you see that you are the served, those that are served by God. Will you do that this morning? Will you, will you consider yourself one who is served by God in the cross? Let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we are not like you. Our needs and our desires are ever before us, and we have many means to avail ourselves of their fulfillment. And so, Lord, I pray that you will give us your spirit to change us, help us to hear and believe what we have heard today. Lord, help us to worship you and to count ourselves among those that are served by God, that are ransomed by the blood of Jesus. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.